Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. One of the weirdest things you hear about in life is when a police officer or a fireman goes bad. And I've heard those stories before where they caught like a volunteer fireman who's out setting fires. Uh, but here's a story that kind of combines the two. Darren sent this to me from the BaltimoreBanner.com. Justin Fenton wrote it. Former Laurel police chief convicted of eight counts of attempted murder and string of fires. String of fires. Not one. A string of fires. So the Howard County jury convicted the man. He's 71 years old. He's from El- Ellicott City. He's a former police chief of the city of Laurel. And uh, they convicted him for setting a string of fires against people who prosecutors say he believed had slighted him. So if you slighted the man, your house might catch on fire. Uh, The man was convicted of eight counts of attempted first-degree murder, two counts of arson, and the verdict followed a six-day trial. The state's attorney said the prosecutors would seek eight life sentences at the man's scheduled June sentencing. This person should have been a guardian and a protector. Instead, he was a menace. Uh, On trial with fires that were set in Howard County, Prosecutors told jurors of a string of fires that they said that the man set across six Maryland counties spanning almost a decade. So he was not on trial for all of them, but apparently they got to bring that up during the trial. His defense attorney had argued that there wasn't sufficient evidence to link the man to the fires and that it couldn't be proven that he intended to kill anyone. He called the fires nuisance fires. And, you know, I got news for you. If you set someone's house on fire and there's somebody inside of it, that's on you. And don't say, oh, well, they can get out. (laughs) It's just a nuisance when your house catches on fire. Just because he's bad at murder, he doesn't get a pass, said the state's attorney in response to that nuisance fire statement. Um, While there was little evidence to physically tie the man to the fires, prosecutors said there was ample circumstantial evidence His cell phone contained a list of the people whose homes were set ablaze, relatives, former co-workers, neighbors, and even his chiropractor. His iPad and home computer also showed searches for the target's addresses around the dates of the fires and a posting to a medical form two weeks after one fire in which he asked how to treat a second-degree burn. (laughs) Prosecutors believe the man left his phone at home when he ventured out into the early morning darkness to set the fires leaving them without cell tower or GPS location data, but data from a fitness app that tracks the steps he took in a day showed him moving about during early morning hours of some of the fires. He also had calendar reminders such as McLaughlin fire in his phone that corresponded to several of the fires. Now, the case didn't start with such evidence. The man had avoided detection and even suspicion for years. But it was the 2019 fire at a home of the man who replaced him as Laurel Police Chief that ramped up the investigation. The arsonist was captured on home surveillance video walking down the driveway, pouring gasoline between two cars. And people started to look at that and wonder if they recognized the man in the video. Investigators then realized a link between that victim and another victim of arson and it's weird to have two people have an arson that have a connection between them the assistant state's attorney said investigators got a search warrant for the man's electronic devices which revealed the target list the list really broke it open they were able to look at names on the list and see if those people were victims of arson the targets of the fires included his successor as police chief the city's administrator former colleagues in the police department, as well as a woman prosecutors say that he had a disagreement with about school redistricting. (laughs) You know, you talk about what someone's motivation is to commit a crime. It's often a monetary motivation. It's often a revenge motivation. But a disagreement about school redistricting. One woman, a director of a court program for children, is listed as white privilege a reference to a disagreement she had with the wife of the defendant. After the defendant's wife took offense at a judge's use of the term white privilege, 
the woman asked her not to participate in a program according to charging documents. Meanwhile, uh, the defense attorney claims that most of the victims don't know why the defendant would target them. So again, the man's attorney said, by all accounts, they had an amicable relationship, uh, referring to the man's former chiropractor. (laughs) He said that the defendant and another woman who was said to have clashed with the defendant over the school redistricting were actually on the same page. But prosecutors in earlier court filings said there were minor provocations, like not being invited to a pool party in one instance, that the victims say could have been the catalyst. His attorney said the victims were reaching, in hindsight, to offer possible explanations. Uh, The defendant did not take the stand, and his attorney called no witnesses. Uh, We'll talk about that in a second. The defendant previously pleaded guilty in March of 2022 to one count of first-degree arson brought in Frederick County. He entered an Alford plea, acknowledging there was enough evidence to convict him, but maintaining his innocence. Sentencing in that case was scheduled for early April. An Alford plea is an unusual plea where you usually strike an agreement with the, the people. So you're a defendant, defense attorney, or your attorney if you're a defendant. <laughs> Talks to the prosecutors and goes, look, my guy doesn't want to go through a trial. Um, He's not wanting to plead guilty, but he'll enter an Alford plea. And an Alford plea is where you go into court as a defendant and you say, I want to skip the trial. The court can find me, in essence, guilty, and I'll concede to that. But I'm not conceding that I am guilty. I'm simply conceding that there's enough evidence to convict me. The defendant did not take the stand, and his attorney called no witnesses. That is a very dangerous game to play. Because you think about this from a juror's perspective. The jury gets called in. They go through jury selection. They're sitting there hearing all this prosecution evidence. And so the prosecution is putting in their side of the case. There were opening statements. So here's what you're going to hear. And they get to hear all this evidence. Prosecution rests. The jury leaves the courtroom, comes back in shortly thereafter, and the judge says, just to let you guys know, gals, uh, the defense is not putting on a case. So we're going directly to closing arguments. Closing arguments will begin tomorrow. Well, if somebody gets to put in their entire case and the other side doesn't put in anything, the knee-jerk response is, oh, they must not have a defense. Now, technically speaking, you don't have to put in a defense, and you got to cross-examine all the prosecution's witnesses. So you did defend the case somewhat, but simply from a persuasion viewpoint, you're trying to persuade somebody. You as an attorney are trying to persuade the jury. It looks really weak if you didn't bother calling any witnesses, your guy didn't testify, and you put in no evidence. So keep in mind that the prosecution put in everything they could. Some of it might be weak. Some of it might not be weak. doesn't matter. So the jury hears several days of testimony from one side and nothing from the other. So the jury is going to have a tendency to think, oh, there's no defense to this because they didn't put in a defense. And they have every right to skip that if they want to. And I've heard of a few cases, famously, Preston Tucker in his trial, the man who wanted to start the car company to build those cars. Uh, they actually said, let's go straight to closing arguments at the close of the plaintiff's, at the close of the prosecution's proofs. And they went straight to closing arguments and the jury came back in their favor. But you have to study that trial to understand how horrible the prosecution was. It was just ridiculous. It's one of the weakest cases ever presented in the federal court in the history of the U.S. federal court system. It was that bad. And it was so bad that not only Tucker, but all of his co-defendants, every single one of them said straight to closing arguments, not even to bother putting in a defense. But that is an extreme example. It's extreme. So this guy here... After, I think they said, you know, quite a few days of testimony, his attorney and he decided to not put in any witnesses, no testimony, no nothing, and uh, go straight to closing arguments. And if there was any evidence, any evidence tying into any one of these crimes, 
you'd want to put up a bigger defense than that. So uh, it's unfortunate that these things happen because, as they point out, he was one of the people whose job was to protect those around him. And I guess he's retired, but he's flipped, according to the jury, who found him guilty of attempted murder and also arson for a string of fires. So it's a bizarre story. Darren, thanks for sending it from the BaltimoreBanner.com. Justin Fenton wrote it. Former Laurel police chief convicted of eight counts of attempted murder in string of fires. Often over petty reasons, it seems. Questions or comments, put them below. Let's talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. Contentment comes not so much from great wealth as from few wants.